Poetry makes people nervous. <laughs> That's what I've learned. Everywhere I go, people have a lot of questions, like, how long should it take to write a poem? Or what happens if you get writer's block? So I tend to tell people that poetry is like pooping. If there's a poem inside you, it has to come out. <laughs> and sometimes it can be really difficult and take much longer than you'd like it to. It might even be painful. And other times, it can be really easy and happen much faster than you expected it. But either way, it is important, and you feel so much better when it's done. <laughs> This explanation of poetry is a real hit with middle school boys, I can tell you that. And yes, it is certainly silly and perhaps even a little bit vulgar. And although I usually mean it in mild jest, it's also pretty helpful for me. Whenever I travel to schools and colleges to perform and teach spoken word poetry, I always meet people who say, oh, I don't like poetry, or I don't get poetry, or poetry is just not for me. They've been led to believe that poetry can only be written by certain types of people, for certain types of people, about very specific subjects. Part of what I try to do in schools is take poetry off of a pedestal and make it a little bit more approachable and accessible. There's nothing more universal than some good scatological humor, but what I'm really trying to do is reshape the frame in which we think about poetry so that it's less distant and sacred and more human, because I think it makes it easier for us to feel like poetry belongs to us, is for us, is from us. And even if it means having to be a little silly or cheeky, I think it's worth it, because I want to welcome people into poetry, especially people who have previously felt unwelcome. I want to celebrate anybody who is trying to make sense of the world through poetry the way I try to make sense of it. In 2011, when my TED Talk went online, something amazing happened. Through the incredible influence of TED and the widespread reaches of the internet, people all around the world saw that talk and reached out to me with excitement and curiosity about spoken word poetry. And it is without an ounce of exaggeration that I say my whole world changed. Probably the most substantial evidence is the way that I've been able to share poetry farther and farther away from home. Since giving that talk, I've been invited to teach and perform in India, Singapore, Australia, Ghana, Mexico, the United Arab Emirates, the British Virgin Islands, France, Sweden, many more, not to mention all across the United States. I mainly live out of a suitcase, and I am in a chronic state of jet lag. I'm also really lucky. And I am just one poet and teacher. I certainly did not intend on becoming a spokesperson for spoken word poetry, but it is an honor when I am treated as such. And when I am invited abroad to share and teach poetry, I take my job seriously. In December of 2012, I was the recipient of a U.S. Department of State award through the American Embassy in Nepal, which allowed me to teach a multifaceted spoken word poetry education platform to over nine schools in Kathmandu. And one morning, I was making myself breakfast in the kitchen of my hotel room when I looked down to see my face on the front page of a newspaper. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen your face on the front page of a newspaper, although I guess in this room it's probably more likely than usual, but it had certainly never happened to me before, and it's very alarming. And so I started to investigate because I couldn't figure out how this had happened. And then I slowly recalled that a few days previous, there had been a young woman who had stayed after my show to ask me some questions. But because she was so young, I had just assumed that she was asking me questions for her school newspaper, not the largest English-speaking newspaper in Kathmandu. Um, but that must have been it, because there was this big, photo of me and this glowing review underneath. And I was so thrilled, I couldn't wait to call home and tell everyone about it. And when I got to the bottom of the article, it said, turn to page seven for exclusive interview. I turned to page seven, and I saw that they had titled the article, For the Love of Words, and I was beaming with pride. And you know how in newspapers, underneath the headline, they'll always give you one line that is to make you want to read the rest of the article. So right underneath, For the Love of Words, it said, poetry is like pooping. 
if there's a poem inside you, it has to come out. Sarah Kay. So I called home and said, well, good news, bad news. <laughs> and mom said, oh no, you and that potty mouth. Um, but there is a phenomenal poet and a dear mentor of mine and fellow potty mouth by the name of Kristen O'Keefe Aptowix. And she has this beautiful poem about women writers that I think about all the time. And the very last line of her poem, she says, I say into the phone, mom, it's hard sometimes to know if you're making any difference at all. And mom says, baby, don't you know how lucky you are? They used to burn women like you. Bust down any door you have to and bring in everyone you can right after. You got a voice, right? Well then, use it. I, Sarah Kay, know how lucky I am to have this voice and people who will listen to it. I know how lucky I am that so many people have busted down so many doors so that I could be here. And even though this moment, this precise talk, might not be exactly what those people were envisioning, I promise I will continue holding open doors and welcoming in everyone I can. Thanks. <laughs>